This is Botox. It is done to rejuvenate your upper face. We will be treating the frown lines, the wrinkles in the middle, the forehead lines, and the crow's feet, which are the wrinkles around your eyes. That will make you look fresh, young, and keep you natural. Welcome to The She Word and an interview special. Now, before we get started, of course, I'm just going to remind you that if you have a look underneath your screen somewhere, you're going to find a subscribe button. Please, please do click on that to make sure that you don't miss out on any of The She Word content because we have a lot going on and so much more coming up. Now, as I just mentioned, it's an interview special today. We're talking about a topic that I've been wanting to discuss for a really long time. Now, my guests today have already been on The She Word. Uh, Nick, Dr. Nikki Mikhailov Stefrach is a family medicine specialist who went on to specialize in aesthetic medicine and appeared on this, the show in season two, Body Modification. I'm coming to you in a second, Nikki. I'm so glad and is so excited to have you back. And Deborah Machia, who has just been on after an awful lot of nagging, <laughs> has finally come on to the She Word, and you were in the show, Women and Beauty. But as I said, today we're going to be talking about a topic that I really think needs to be addressed an awful lot more than is, because we're going to be talking about, am I saying this right, med aesthetics, aesthetics. medical aesthetics, mm -hmm. because you are both, as I mentioned, qualified doctors have gone into this field. So before we go any further, I'm going to ask you, Nikki, first, because it's a little bit longer uh, <laughs> ago that you were on the She Word, just give a bit of background to you and what you do, but how on earth... Did you get into this? But you are a qualified doctor. Yes, I'm a qualified doctor. Um, and to be honest with you, my speciality didn't come to me easily when I graduated. Some people know exactly what they want. Um, I wasn't one of those. Um, basically, my dad's a gynecologist, so everybody assumed I'm going to take that line. You know, it was like an assumption. You know, you're going to take gyne, right? No, I liked gyne, but I didn't, I, I didn't like, I like a lot of variety. You know, so anyway, long story short, ended up working as a GP, which I liked. Um, I specialized in it as well. Um, I enjoyed it. I liked the, the people interaction. I liked the fact that you get into people's families, you know. And then um, we went, we were living overseas in Abu Dhabi and the baby started coming. <laughs> and um, <laughs> on returning to Malta, um, it wasn't easy to, to join the GP circle again. Um, I could, I wasn't available anymore, you know, home visits and all that. Um, I always really liked uh, aesthetics, med aesthetics, it always appealed to me. And I had done some uh, diploma, whatever, when I was still living in the UAE. And we start, I started working in that field. Um, and then obviously, shall I continue about Debbie and I? Well, no, 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 question, no, hang I think. fire, hang fire for a second. Cause so I'm gonna let Debbie, that's my history. <laughs> I'm going to let you chip in here because like I say, you, you after... I don't know, about six months of, of nagging you finally came on to a <laughs> She Word show. Um, give a little bit of background just as a refresher for, for the, our She Worders. So um, after I graduated, opposite to Nikki, I thought I was going to do gynae. <laughs> and I had started, <laughs> yes, I had started my speciality in gynae. I had done my part one and I thought I was going to, to go through that line. Then I fell pregnant. I had my twins. My first pregnancy and you know having twins was not easy so doing nights was very tiring i used to go home having to tend to the babies and i decided it wasn't for me and then i had started working into aesthetics doing laser initially you know and i was quite happy i mean I, this this field started intriguing me and i was excited to learn more and then the the, the story goes on i mean nikki and i met and we Okay, okay, so pause for a second, because, I mean, listen, we, we're five minutes in, and I'm already wondering in my mind if if studying gynecology is genetic <laughs> and, and this sort of thing, or is it just a... But we'll come back to that another day. But I think uh, before we go any further of how to you guys met and decided to work together, what is med aesthetics? So, I mean, med aesthetics is... Um, the, the practice of aesthetics, which is basically um, improving oneself through injectables and there's laser treatments and whatnot, but from the medical aspect, which is as it should be. So 
performed by a doctor. This is not, um, we're not speaking about the beautician side of aesthetics. There is a beautician side of aesthetics when it comes to, for example, um, waxing, threading, facials, um, manicures. But I mean, they all sort of fall into that, but that's not the medical side. Then there's the medical side, which obviously when you're dealing with certain either equipment or injectables, there has to be a certain depth of knowledge and experience. Um, other than that, you can face um, serious complications. Okay, so my next question is, so we, we're talking about today, we're not, well, let's say what we're not talking, we're not talking about threading, we're not talking about waxing, we're not talking about tattooing or anything like that. That's to one level. We're now talking about something that's, would we say it's a little bit more invasive, it's injectables, it's, I mean, you tell me what else, what else falls under that? Botox and fillers, PRPs, peels. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. What's a PRP? Um, Plated so, rich, plasma. Plasma. rich plasma. Okay. Basically used for um, regenerating hair and hair loss. It's um, used also from the um, medical side when it comes to injecting into joints. So basically it's a procedure where someone's blood is withdrawn. It's spun in a centrifuge. Um, you'll this is all done in the clinic. Um, you, the yellow part of the blood will come out, which is rich in your own um, platelets. All right, the plasma is rich in platelets. That's obviously your own, so it's super like, so as to say, um, lo loaded with, with all the right things that your body needs. And then it's injected into, for example, areas in the scalp where there is, for example, hair, hair loss, thinning of hair. All right, so it's not going to be effective if you have um, total alopecia, for example, but in areas which are especially hormone induced or um, when estrogen is, is failing, and so we get receding hairlines and, and patches in, that, that works over there and has okay. to be repeated. Okay. So then my question to you, Debbie, because she's the talker, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I came with her today. <laughs> my question to you is, if these med aesthetic procedures are invasive, such as injections and so on, and, and even separating blood and, and re-injecting that, so on and so forth, in Malta... Do you have to be medically qualified to be able to do these procedures or can anybody set up with a Botox? No. no, you have to be medically qualified for injectables. It is against the law to do it unless you're medically qualified, although unfortunately they are being done. Because then you have to know not only how to deal with the procedures, but you have to know how to deal with the complications when they arise. So I think that at that point, definitely you have to have a good medical background. You know, you have to be attend courses, learn how to deal with complications. You have to know your anatomy really well, you know. So I'm positive that you have to consult a doctor before you do these procedures. Brilliant. And I'm glad that we've sort of qualified that. So now we know what we're talking about. Now I can ask you, <laughs> how did you guys start? Because you, you work together, you share a business. Yes. How did you meet? How did you decide, okay, now we're going to do this? It's a long history. Then. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so Debbie and I have known each other since we were 18. Sixth form. <laughs> Sixth form. We were in the same, uh, we ended up in the same school. Um, we were in different classes, but we we're in the same, in the science class. Um, and we became friends straight away. Um, we had the same clique of people. In fact, I know Debbie before she met her husband. <laughs> We've known each other that long. I knew. I actually knew it when her husband had a crush on her. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, so then, and then we started the medical course together, always together, um, in the same group as well. We graduated. And we graduated the same. And then so we took these different lines, as we mentioned already. But for example, when she had her twins, I was in, behind the delivery suite. I, w I went to see them, remember? Um, and we had been, I had visited once when we were living abroad to come and see as well um, the twins and then Daniel, her second, uh, second, her third child. So yes, we've always been in, in each other's life. Now you continue about the business. <laughs> And then we started, coincidentally, we started working together. I mean, and obviously we rekindled the friendship because we had different pathways at that point. And from there, we decided that why not, you know, why not open a, a small business between us? And from there, we got going. And now we're, we're very happy. I mean, we have a small business, but, you know, we share the clinic. And we, we get on well very well. Brilliant. We're on the same page. <laughs> so then do you do the same thing or does one of you take fillers and one of you take Botox or, or how does that work? No, we practically do the same things. There are a few things which we do differently. Nikki does microscular therapy, which is the injection for the veins, and I do peels. But basically, I mean, we do, we do everything together, you know. We share views. Sometimes we ask each other things. I mean, it's, it's a big help. 
who support I, uh, each other. I find the relationship with them very special because um, people assume there's so much rivalry all the time, you know, that people assume, how can you be doing the same thing or working in the same clinic? Have it's it's no problem for us, you know. I mean, she has her patients, I have my patients. Sometimes we share them, Sometimes and we share views, we discuss, we go training very, very often in the air abroad to get our training it's, it's, done. It's fun for us, you know. We go abroad together. And... There's so much love in the room. It's <laughs> it just is, it's lovely. <laughs> well, listen, I'm really glad, and I'm so glad that we're here, and I'm glad that we're having this conversation. And I tell you why, because uh, as a woman who has said in the past, I would never undertake uh, an aesthetic, medesthetic procedure. <laughs> I absolutely said that was never going to happen. I can confirm, and I've absolutely openly said that, that is a young woman's <laughs> statement. <It's true. laughs> I think it's something that you can say as a young person, but as you get older and as time moves on and is not necessarily kind to us, our minds change. But on top of that as well, Botox, for instance, let's just take Botox for a second, is undoubtedly the number one non-invasive procedure in 2022. And I've said this before on the show, over 7.4 million people in the US alone are receiving Botox treatments. So this is just one of the treatments that we're talking about today. Globally, the Botox market is worth about $4.4 billion. So this is a massive rise in just Botox. We're not talking about anything else. So what happened? What happened to this metastatic uh, market and, and industry? Because 10 years ago, we might not be having this conversation. 10 years ago, I would still be saying Botox is dangerous. <laughs> Sticking stuff in your face is, is definitely something I'd never do. Is the industry safer or is it just become more acceptable? I think it's a mixture of both. I think that the practice has become safer, but I think it's with the the birth of social media. Yeah, surely. That's the, the big, for me, that's the big push because people are constantly taking selfies, po constantly posting. And um, that's what life has become now. I mean, especially the, the younger generation that are born into it. So everybody wants to look good and then they start obsessing, you know, oh, I have a, a wrinkle here, I've got a frown line here. Um, I didn't have these before. And then obviously people want um, uh, want a solution, you know, which which is av available. Um, obviously, then there's the medical advice that comes in. But I think that that's what yes, yes, was really pushed. You think social media has pushed the Botox industry? I think social media has pushed films, the whole so. image industry. Yes, I think so too. It's become quite competitive. I mean, we compare each other. Women compare each other, you know, on social media, don't you think? I mean, I feel that, and I think that has pushed women to do more aesthetic treatments, you know, they want to look better, they want to look like that actress, or I think that social media has had a big effect. This is not a new statement from you, Debs, because when you were on the show, uh, Women and Beauty, you absolutely, you said, women are now so competitive with each other, so we, we are placed in competition with each other, and this has come out of the shows that we've done on social media and body image and so on and so forth. Completely, completely and utterly agree. But if, but then has there been, a, how can I put this? Yes, there's an image issue, but also uh, even with an image issue, I myself said never, ever, 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 ever. And then I saw a friend of mine, ours, uh, hi Gabby, who said, I said, wow, you look amazing. Uh, what, what's, you know, what's different? And she said, I've had Botox. Now she was, she is in her, or was in her thirties. So she was quite a bit younger than I would assume. So I come back to again, <clears throat> is Botox safer than it used to be? Is it more acceptable than it used to be? Because with social media, whether social media is a, a, as a, a component for us to be more competitive, there's still that sort of, that's still the element of taking a step into something like fillers or, or mm -hmm. a, a metastatic safer than they used to be? Yes, uh -huh. I think so, personally. I think that they are safer. I think that there is more knowledge in general. People read more, you know, they ask more. And even us, we, we're ready to give information, you know, during a consultation. I spend the first five to ten minutes explaining just about what the procedure is about. They need to know, not just, you know, about it. The, procedure, the, the, the steps of the procedure, you know, I explain to them in detail what, what the Botox does, and I think that helps. You know, so knowledge, I think, has become different than it was 10 years. 10 years ago, people didn't know much about these things. Nowadays, they ask you, and I think that has helped a lot. 
Now, filler is made up of hyaluronic acid, which we already have in our bodies, but with age, we tend to lose. Now, I'm going to be injecting it in the temple area, which is the area over here, and which it's not your traditional uh, thing for someone to come into the clinic and ask, I'd like to have my temples filled. It's just one of those areas which um, you just don't pinpoint. However, so people are more obsessed with their cheeks, you know, with their lips. But once you realize that the temple is a little bit sunken, so there's a hollow, you will definitely be aware of it. Also, I think that's what contributed to what you were asking is that even also the trend of the aesthetics is changing. So people, many people share the same opinion you had, right? Age has to do with it because yes, the 20 year olds and 30 year olds might say, no, I'll never do this. But when they get to 38, 39 plus, um, then they start saying, oh my, I need a lift, you know, I need something to, to push me, to, to boost me, you know, and that's where they come to the clinic and they discuss, we don't, we're not going to convince them, but you sort of put, set the facts straight and then they will decide. Um, but I also think that trends have a lot to do with the sort of stigma that there was to the aesthetics, because till 10 years ago, even more recent, the, the 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 techniques used weren't so fine, refined. When it came to fillers, the products weren't as good as they are now. Don't get me wrong, there still are mediocre products out there, which are much cheaper and which some injectors choose. But hey, I wouldn't want those in my face, but you know, uh, each to his own. But um, obviously when people would see those, you know, horrible lips or really stretched faces over Botoxing, over freezing, then they would be a bit put off. Whereas now the results, at least for Debbie and I, we re it's one of the pillars of our, of our clinic, of our practice, that we really strive for natural results. So I think that when people ask and they say, but you're looking really good, did you do something? And then they might say, yes, but it, it looks really natural, yes. So I think people are more, um, there's more of a chance that they go for it. We're going to dive into that in just a second, but you just touched on something that is really important, and that is uh, safety. And that is, you know, these are our faces. You ladies work with a woman's, and I'm sure a man's, face. I'm going to ask about men in a second, but let's stick with where you, 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 you actually metaphorically and literally touching a woman's face. You, you're, you're working with a woman's face. And if something goes wrong with that, it is the place where everybody looks first. So there is a, a definitely a, a responsibility and, and you guys, uh, as we've had this conversation, we'll continue to, to discuss in a minute about what you should and shouldn't do in looking natural. But for one second, and I think it was my initial concern, what can go wrong? So talking about, let's pick out fillers and Botox. What are the things that can go wrong? Because I think it's important for, for our she-worders to know that it can go. Sometimes things can go wrong. And certainly we'll talk about, we'll talk about people who are injecting who shouldn't be injecting. Again, we'll talk about them in a second. But just generally speaking, what, what can happen? What can go wrong with these things? I mean, the facial anatomy is, is complex, you know? Um, so when you, for example, injecting a filler, you have to have a knowledge of where the major arteries lie. So um, if you do, and these things happen, you know, because um, once you practice, there's a chance of having a complication. No matter how hard you try to be safe, these things can happen. Obviously there are probabilities and statistics, but it's always on our mind as injectors. Um, if you do, God forbid, I mean, inject a, an artery with a filler, you'll cause what is known as a vascular occlusion. So you're basically occluding, closing the, the artery. Obviously that can have a possibly detrimental effect. You know, you're going to block the artery, block the blood supply, and you can end up with having necrosis of that part of the face. So again, um, we're not trying to put people off and neither are we trying to say that these things don't happen to us. They can happen, as we said, but you need to A, take precautions for it not to happen. B, um, if it does happen, know how to recognize it. And time is of the essence over here. So you have to know once you inject, there are certain signs that we look out for. We ask, we ask, you know, if there's a lot of pain, that's an eye opener, it shouldn't be that painful. So, you know, these things that can maybe abort that um, thing from happening. And if it does happen, then how are we going to fix it? You know, so I think that that's, uh, that's key, you know. But it's not frequent. I don't know. I wouldn't say it's frequent, not even statistic-wise. But once you've done so many thousands of cases, you're meant to have, for example, two along the line. You know what I mean? But, I mean, well, 
touch wood. <laughs> I really don't like mentioning these things, but yes, that's one of the complications. That's one of the, the complications you wouldn't like to have. Yeah. I mean, there are may, very minor complications, whether it be called a complication, side effects, bruising, you know, this type of thing. Um, God forbid, Debbie will go through the Botox ones now, but another one, which I mean, is not mentioned often. If it does, I, I think you just pack up and, and leave the business. Would be that with certain fillers in certain areas, um, you can possibly, if it's injected into the artery, end up with, a, with blindness. So these things I think are important because um, just to show that when you have no medical knowledge, I was about to say, oh, I was about to say that's what's reassuring about having a doctor undertake these procedures because I'm assuming that, well, not assuming, it, it goes without saying that a doctor Less chance, understands <laughs> anatomy much more than somebody who doesn't because you guys have obviously studied for a long time. So I, I'm just addressing the things that could go wrong because I think it's, it's really important to be very honest about them and say that, that nothing is without drawbacks exactly. and, and without and you have to be very very careful about who you choose to to undertake exactly. a procedure now botox will come to my journey in a moment but botox the one thing i know is you can get a drooping eye yes a drooping eyelid it's also very rare, but it can happen, you know. It, it can are... happen just weeks before your wedding, Just I'm just saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I always like to mention to the clients, uh, to add up to what Nikki was saying, when, Botox and fillers, I like to mention these things, not to scare the clients, you know, but at least if something happens, they might not dismiss it as being normal. They might say, okay, I have a bit of pain, I have maybe skin discoloration, but they won't worry if they don't know that that could be a complication. So once they're signing a consent form, I feel obliged as a doctor to explain to them what to look out for. You know, when, when doing Botox and fillers and something goes wrong, I tell them that these are rare complications, but at least they're aware of them. You know, so I feel that's very important when doing a consultation. Um, now, when it comes to Botox, yes, um, Botox is important also. It's not only about the droopy eyelid. That can happen. It's very rare. Sometimes if the product um, goes inside the, the orbit, there is a muscle which pulls the eyelid up. If the Botox affects that muscle, then the eyelid can drop. It is obviously temporary because Botox is reversible. And there are varying degrees. You can have a just a small, a tiny amount of that, you know, a, a small grade of it. And there are some drops which can help. Um, and that's it, basically. And nothing really can go wrong. I mean, it goes back after six months. It goes back four to six months to normal, you know. Mm -hmm. But then the way it is injected, Botox is, impo is also important. So, for instance, you can get droopy eyebrows. People might not be aware of that. So if it is injected in the wrong muscles, you know, even the eyebrows can drop, you know, because there, there's a certain balance which must be kept. So we have to have good knowledge of the muscles of the face to, to inject Botox properly. You know, the same with the lower face. I mean, Botox is injected even in the lower face. If you accidentally hit a muscle, say, that, that helps in, during smiling, you can get a, a droopy smile, you know, which is not nice to have aesthetically. Eh? So these things have to be mentioned and we have to be aware of them. What if you could start your journey over? Start here and start again there. That's how life works, in a circular way. We understand the importance of circles, and that's why you are at the heart of ours. Find your way to wellness with Browns. Absolutely. Well, we're going to come to the benefits in a second, but before we get there, as I said, I changed my mind about metastatics simply see through seeing the effects uh, that it had on a friend of ours, uh, on Gabby, and, and I had the, the guts to ask her and say, Gabby, what's going on? What's different? <laughs> um, and I came to you, and uh, I put my face metaphorically and physically in your hands. And literally, I said to you, what can I do? What do you suggest? And this is kind of because I know nothing about it. And I didn't come to you and say, I want this and I want this. I said, what, what can you do and what, what can we do together? Um, and there were some things, and you, yeah, and you were very lovely. You said to me, what bugs you? And I said, well, you know, I've got a few wrinkles here. And then these, had, I had noticed as I got a little bit older, particularly because obviously we're on camera as well. And these lines, these smokers lines, and I said, and I, you called them smokers lines. And I said, but I, I never smoked. I haven't, <laughs> no, no, I used to smoke oh, 30 right. a day, but that was a long, long time ago. <laughs> and you said, we can do something about that. And I have to say, when you did, I, the immediate... Uh, the immediate effect once once the bruising had worn off, and I wasn't expecting I I wasn't expecting the bruising when I first came to talk to you about it, but the immediate effect was oh my word that's amazing 
that's amazing. But I knew nothing about these procedures before I came to you. And this is why I want to talk openly about it. I'm not embarrassed to say that I've, you know, I've, I'm working with you guys because you guys are taking amazing care. But again, let's talk about the procedures for a second, both fillers and Botox. What if somebody's considering it, they, they've got a couple of lines that are really bugging them or a little bit here or something, what can they expect in terms of pain and discomfort? Because you mentioned bruising and that was something when you told me, it was something I wasn't quite prepared for in my head. And then I was like, oh, oh, and now... I have in mind to plan that you don't do this like a week before a wedding exactly. and, and these sorts of things. But what can you expect? Let's talk about Botox, first of all. What can you expect to happen after you've had the Botox? How long does it take to to take effect and what can you expect as results? So Botox is relatively quite painless. I mean, there are small injections inside the muscles, very tiny needles, you know. You will get a bit of discomfort whilst you're having it injected, but nothing more than that. You might have a bit of bruising, although the needles are small, and maybe some swelling at the sites of injection. Otherwise, I mean, then you have to be careful. In the first 24 to 48 hours, we advise not to have very strenuous exercise, no excessive sweating, no very warm temperatures like saunas or very hot environments like spending a day in the sun. And the effect starts kicking in about three days after injection. Why no heat? Sorry, I'm just going to, I'm going to break that down. Why? the longevity. Ah, okay. It could possibly affect the longevity of the right. Water. So it's not because something that's going to mean that they blow up or anything. It's just because it's not <laughs> going to be as. <laughs> it's just going to be. <laughs> I've just got this vision now of, of things, but it's just because it's not going to be as effective. Uh -huh. And they also suggest, for instance, that they are not rough with the areas of injection. Let's say they don't wax the the eyebrow area immediately after we've done the the treatment, so that they don't move the Botox around. You know, it remains in the muscles where we've injected it. Otherwise, they can lead a practically normal life. You know, I mean, nothing is really going to change. And then after three days, the Botox kicks in. It usually takes about a week. And then they start seeing the effect. After about a week, we like to see them again, usually. After a week to 10 days, we like to review the clients so that we can discuss, are you happy, you know? Is there anything else which we'd like to, to touch up? And we, we see also ourselves that, that there's a symmetry, you know, that there's harmony in the face. So we usually get them back to see them. Um, it will be included sort of in the, in the procedure. What I found really interesting is the first time I came to you and I had Botox uh, again because it was it was a recommendation from a friend. I thought, oh, I'll give it a go. I was really profoundly um, affected by the numbness, and I was like, "What? This is incredible! What? I can't raise my eyebrows." Now that I've done it with you a couple of times, I don't even notice. Yeah, ah, it's like true. it's like you don't raise your eyebrows and you don't feel exactly. anything. It's just. <laughs> You, you, it's everything the first time yes. and then you get used to it yeah the first time I was like <laughs> <laughs> it's I can't true. do it <laughs> but now it's just really natural and I assume that's also why after a number of times it 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 is more effective because yes. you, you're actually using those muscles less of course and that's exactly what it's doing it's just freezing the muscles so that you don't create those wrinkles expression lines. expression lines exactly. and it doesn't freeze the face because you can still be as, as expressive once you as preserve well. the eyebrows and you know we do it naturally then you're fine because the eyebrows are going to move around obviously the frozen look is when you can't move your eyebrows and everyone looks the same <laughs> but it's a, it's a great one isn't it <laughs> talk to me about about fillers so what can you expect with fillers because again once again massive surprise with fillers but i mean then as soon as the bruising had gone down i was like good grief because it's the effects are immediate exactly with fillers the effects are immediate as you just said the difference between filler and botox um when it comes to how quickly they work um, okay so regards discomfort for fillers um obviously fillers are used in different areas of the face so you can have cheeks injected jawbone you can have the nasolabial folds which is this line here lips um, lots of places. Now, generally, if the filler is um, going to be ap applied to play deep onto the bone, all right, like cheeks, for example, I mean, you can feel how superficial our cheekbone is. So obviously it's going to be applied. When it's hitting the periosteum, the bone, it's not very painful. Um, you might feel a little bit like um, stuff. Some people feel a bit like queasy stuff thing when they feel it, but it's fine. Plus the filler itself has, has an aesthetic within it. So once you've injected the first time, it starts working. So relatively painless. Lips, however, the perioral area is the most sensitive. So over there, and it makes sense because you're in skin, you're superficial. That's where you have more nerve endings. So you're going to feel it more. So for that area, um, we usually apply a local anesthetic 
over and above the anesthetic that is already in the fillet. Um, and again, it's preparing the patient properly, explaining, explaining that, listen, do you have an occasion coming up? You need to, for lips, you need to at least leave 10 days to two weeks. You might have bruising, swelling, a bit of lumps and bumps, very normal. So preparation, consultations are really important. Sometimes the patients sort of almost object, you know, but what's a consultation going to cost me? Um, do I have to come? I want to do it straight away. I've done it elsewhere. I'm pretty firm with this. You know, this is not elsewhere. It's you with me. I need to make sure certain info was given and that you've understood. Um, and then we can sign a consent form once you're informed, not just sign a consent form like that. So it's important. So yes, as regards discomfort, some people will feel it more than others, but it's your pain threshold at the end of the day. But otherwise, very, very decent, very acceptable, I think. Well, I'm glad you mentioned lips because, as I said, I came to you and lips was not something we focused on at all. There were some little bits that were irritating me and, and you said, oh, but we could do something here and so on and so forth. And just things like minor things that had, had irritated me. But lips, oh my word, if you mention fillers <laughs> today in 2023, lips are going to be the thing that everybody refers to and everybody talks about. Because there are a lot of women that are getting big lips. lips and we talked about it on women and beauty but it is a trend that is happening a lot now i have had conversations with both of you where you've said that metastatics should not be noticeable if you have some work done if you guys are, are, are consulting and if you're, you're going to make recommendations that really aren't noticeable in that you would look at someone and say oh that's nice you wouldn't say oh wow they've had the lips done exactly. but how, then how then do you both respond when somebody comes in because this big lip thing is is trending in the you know it's a long-term trend women are still coming asking for it and it's not a local thing it's no. all over Worldwide. the world um so how do you respond to that because this is this is a is, this is a trend that that i'm assuming that maybe you guys don't necessarily think no. is is a good thing i think it's more common with the younger generation they're very into trends and um these big lips personally i treat each patient differently obviously so it it also depends what you're going to start off with so if you're going to start off with a very thin lip, it has to be graded, you know, going up slowly. Sometimes you start with already big lips, in which case I like to try and discuss with the, with the patient that I'm not comfortable with this. You know, I think your lips are full enough and um, I don't think that I'm going to necessarily make you look better. Now, I'm speaking for myself here. I, I have no problem at all with losing a patient um, if it's not something that I really agree with and feel comfortable with. So, um, personally, I would not like my signature on those types of lips. I have a couple of clients who are quite niche and um, they fall into a different bracket than, than other, I can't really explain right now, but um, that's, it's, it's very much them, you know, they've always had these big lips and it's like their trademark. It's their identity. It's their identity exactly. and, I, and I sense that and I understand that, but generally speaking, um, Personally, I'm, I'm, I don't like to comply with that, um, but I'll explain, you know, and many times most people come on board, you know, I say, listen, for example, I'll just put a little bit in for a bit of hydration, but we're not going to go overboard. Many people, because they come and they trust, you know, and they, they trust your, what, the information you're giving them, you know, but you get many patients that come and they bring out their phone. Listen, I want my lips to look like this, just like this. Obviously, I have to explain. We're not starting off with the same type of lip and this won't necessarily um, fit into your facial proportions because that's, as Debbie was saying, the harmony in the face is, is super important. Personally, I wouldn't like to look at a face and see it dominated by a pair of lips. I would like to all to fit in and to make you look better. But obviously, not everybody agrees with that. So, Well, Debs, you mentioned this last time when you were on the show Women in huh? Beauty about you were, just like Nikki here, you were happy to turn a client yeah. away. I agree completely with Nikki. I want to ask you something different about this this lips thing because it is such a big trend. What is, I, I, as I was thinking about this and since we had that show, it's been really bugging me. What is the long-term potential effect of repetitively having filler in your lips? Because I, I this kit kept bugging me because if, if fillers eventually dissipate, which I'm assuming they do. They have a lifespan of up to a year, I do believe. If they eventually dissipate and your lips, your skin on your lips has been extended, are there, 
are there side effects afterwards if you keep having these big lips over and over and over again? Yes, there are. I mean, some patients will not wait a year. It becomes like sometimes there's a little bit of an addiction, you know. They leave four months and then they want another syringe. You will have to be careful because the lips are a small compartment. They're a closed compartment. So there is a limit to how much they can take in. You know, I mentioned it last time when they, they put in too much filler. Sometimes you get lip filler migration. So the, the lip filler goes out of the pink lip into the white lip up here. And you can see sometimes, especially when you look at a profile of a client, of a patient, you will see... That's what it is. You will see this, like, like tiny a bit ridge. of filler, a ridge of filler up, 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 up above the lip, you know, and it, it aesthetically does not look good at all. You know, so we have to be aware of these things, you know. Some patients will not even be aware of this problem, but the lips are small. You can't keep on pushing filler and filler, you know, so there is a limit to, to how much filler we can put in. Overfilling is a big problem. Well, I also had in my head that if somebody had had a lot of filler for, let's say, over five or six years, and for some reason they happened to be in, I don't know, the deepest, darkest Africa, and they couldn't have filler, <laughs> that their, their lips would end up looking like a deflated balloon and, and a bit floppy. But that was in my head. <laughs> I, but I was I was curious to ask what the, the side effects of long-term overfilling and also, so also some clients tend to mix fillers, so they shop around, they go from one doctor to another, possibly not to doctors, and they put in different fillers, you know, and that might cause problems. Some fillers are not dissolvable. Some fillers are, you know, cheap stuff that you maybe permanent. get permanent chemicals, which might not, you know, you might not permanent even, fillers, permanent fillers, which you might not even be able to dissolve, and that creates a problem. So we have to be careful, even with the products that we are using on the market. There are loads of things. You know, I mean, we can vouch for ourselves, but we definitely use fillers which are, you know, FDA approved and, you know, good products. Quality, you know, good, good quality longevity. and good longevity and that they can, they can be dissolved if an emergency happens, you know. So that's important. Well, you very nicely led me into another question and we're going to, I want to ask you both um, with regards to reputable and not so reputable providers of metastatics. Seeing as this is fairly new as a phenomenon, what are the long-term effects of fillers, Botox, and any of the other procedures that you've mentioned, or do we just not know yet? No, I think I think that um, this, these products have been used for a long time, even, especially when it comes to Botox, for example. Um, so I don't think long-term, I mean, many people come and ask, so if I decide to sell Botox and then I stop it, what's going to happen there? Nothing's going to happen. Your muscles are going to go back to what they were. You're not going to be happy because you're suddenly going to see yourself full of your wrinkles again. <laughs> you wake up one day and suddenly 20 years have just clopped you know, on you. <laughs> let's face it, once you start doing it, you don't really want to go back. But for whatever reason, financial, you just don't want to do it anymore, whatever, you, you can stop it. It's not a problem. Um, same for fillers. Fillers are composed of hyaluronic acid, at least the ones we use. Um, hyaluronic acid we have in our skin already and that's why with age it goes that's why you need the filler you need a replacement of that so it's eventually going to break down so if you don't have a case of as Deborah was mentioning overfilling different products etc it's going to just go back to what it was no you're not going to have skin that's hanging fine at the end of the day because the amounts injected are small we are speaking of one syringe is one mil it's not even a teaspoon so obviously if you are going to get overfilled then from if you're going to be overfilled and then suddenly you're going to get deflated after a year, you're going to look very saggy because you had overfilling and now you have nothing, you know. But if it's done very subtly, then the, the gradient is not going to be so evident. So, you know, it goes away and then you, you refill. But you're not going to have any extra excess skin. People worry about these things. So, no, long term, I don't think that there's any problem. These are totally temporary, you know. I think that's the key is that it's temporary. It's something it's that you, you grade it, like Nikki mentioned. So you, you do things grad gradually, you know, not you do everything in a couple of months. You want to do this, this, this. I don't, I don't like that thing. So you, have, you can go slowly up the stairs, you know. You say, let's do a, some cheeks this year, and then after a year we retouch the cheeks, and then maybe do a bit of smoker's lines, and that way it looks naturally. Yeah, you know? yeah. So. Well, we've talked a lot about this. As I mentioned before, you've both been on shows before, and I would really recommend going back and seeing what these ladies said in the shows before. That's season two, Body Modification, season three, Women and Beauty. But to, to finish up with this discussion, because I, as I said, I had a big heart for this, uh, this discussion today. Um, I would like you both just to finish with a thought on if a woman is considering some help to stay looking her best or achieve the best for herself 
And she's now at a point, like maybe myself, where I said, I'm never going to do it. And then I was like, maybe I'll do it. And then I'm like, Debs, you have to help me. Um, what is your best advice, starting with, your, with you, Nikki? I think your best advice would be to find um, a doctor who appeals to you and that you feel you can trust. And really important that they, you ask for information and that it's, it's provided. And at the end of the day, you know what your options are. You know, the, the the doctor involved will 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 give you different ideas that you can go through and maybe less invasive, injectable, not injectable. There are other options, you know, you can go for a peel, you can go for whatever, but at least the options will be given to you. And you're not, you don't feel that you're being cornered into doing something you don't want to do. And then once those fears are addressed, the person is free to make up their own mind, but at least they feel that they're in a safe place. And I think that's very important that they feel that they're, um, they're going to feel that they're going to look better by the end of it, not they've got this fear, you know. So that's what I think. I mean, at the end of the day, na natural results and safety are super important. I have nothing much to add, really. Um, yes, I agree that you have to be comfortable with your injector, you know, that you have to find someone you can communicate with, ask all the questions you need. And then at the end of the day, it will be up to the patient to decide, you know, but I mean, we want them to look good, we want them to look better. So I'm not against that at all these treatments, and I do them myself, and I, I really enjoy the job, you know, and I think it's great to improve oneself, but naturally. You know, you said something, Deb, so I'm just going to finish with this, because you said something when I first came to see you. you say, I said to you, do you have these procedures? And you said, absolutely. And, and I do believe that you guys look after each other, yes. right? So if you want to go to someone to have a procedure, it's worth asking if they have the procedures themselves, because you guys are the advert for your own business. And when I said to you, can you do something here? Can we just do something here? Can you look after me? You sat down and explained everything to me in detail and then kind of pointed out on yourself, well, you know, this is, and it was great. It was super, true. not that I'm outing you on, on, a, on an interview, but it was really reassuring. And that's what built for me trust is that you were not talking about something you didn't know and hadn't experienced. You were talking about something that you could highly recommend. Ladies, thank you very much indeed for this. Thank you. I it was really having us. super appreciate. And thank you for just really breaking down something that is very, very key right now. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for so having much. us. It was lovely. <laughs> <laughs>